Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the DCC seminar. And uh, I would request Dr. Parmesh to come on stage and uh, welcome the gathering and introduce the speaker. Thank you, Joshifa. Good morning, everybody. Professor J. Srinivasan, R. Srinivasan, Pandit, Ghosh, where is the lady here? And uh, people from the Diveja Center of Climate Change and also Earth Science, I have a great pleasure welcoming you for this seminar and for this morning. The topic, how metal stable isotopes offer unique insights this is the detection and exposure assessment. This topic will be spoken by none other than Dr. Catherine Schilling. I have a great pleasure extending a welcome to her also. And I request uh, Dr. Arjit Mishra of the Witch and Climate Change to formally introduce the speaker. Welcome, sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Parmesh. Uh, so today's speaker is Dr. Catherine Schilling. She is assistant professor at Columbia, and uh, she did her uh, PhD from Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany, followed by a postdoctoral stint at uh, UC Davis. Then later, she joined Oxford University for six years as an independent re researcher before joining Columbia. So her research primarily focuses on uh, like she's an isotope geochemist and she used isotopes as a tool to fingerprint, source fingerprint uh, so like metals and metalloids and their pathways in environment as well as in human health. And uh, I welcome Catherine on the stage to enlighten us about this interesting topic. So thank you, Catherine, for coming. Please come on stage. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, present today at the seminar. Can you hear me or do I need to take the mic? Use the mic. Is it okay? Okay. Um, so it's my first visit to Bangalore. I have been to other cities in India and I do a travel through India. So it's like my second stop. I was in Hyderabad before, after that I got to Mumbai and uh, Delhi. Um, I really like, love your campus, so I would like to stay here. It's so nice and green, and as you see in New York, we have a lot of just buildings, and that's a view from the Rockefeller Center, uh, south of New York, so that's basically there. You see the ocean in the back? Um, yeah, so, I mean, New York is a great city. If you get a chance to visit, come uh, and come to Columbia. So the, my topic is on uh, presenting uh, how we can use uh, metal stable isotopes as a new and innovative tool to detect diseases and also uh, trace exposure uh, in the environment. Um, so you probably all know about isotopes, but this is a very established field in earth sciences, but not so much in the biomedical field and environmental health sciences. So um, a little bit about myself. I mean, <laughs> I, you already got introduction, but. So I'm an assistant professor at uh, Columbia at the Mayman School of Public Health. So I'm also affiliated to the climate school at Columbia. I'm also affiliated to the earth sciences department. Um, so I did uh, my master's in geology at the University of Leipzig in Germany. Um, then from there, I, trans I went to a uh, university in Mainz and I did my PhD there in soil sciences and microbiology. So I moved away from the hard rock uh, geology. Uh, geology earlier, earth life, and um, from there, transition to, went to Berkeley. UC Berkeley worked in the Department of Environmental uh, Sciences Policy and Management, worked on uh, wetlands and metal cycling and how that affects, uh, is affected by climate change. Crossed the ocean again, went to Oxford. There I started to work on uh, the application of isotopes in the biomedical field, and then joined uh, uh, Mayman School of Public Health in 2021. I'm also the director of the metals lab uh, at the Mayman School of Public Health. We do a lot of cohort studies with thousands of samples. We measure metals in urine and blood and serum, whatever you can imagine, and biospecimens. 
But what is all common in all these uh, stations, um, I ran this one on the slide, okay. That I always work with the periodic table and I was mainly interested in all the elements in the periodic table, they have isotopes. And we know the periodic table has more than 100 elements, but we have 3000 isotopes. Not all of them are of my interest because of most of them are radioactive isotopes. I'm interested in the stable isotopes and especially the stable isotope of metals. Okay, if you go to a pharmacy, that's what you see a lot of people taking these days supplements. And um, that's essential metals we all need. We need zinc, we need iron, and we need calcium. And especially um, zinc and iron is actually a big problem in India. A lot of people have iron and zinc deficiency. It's just related to the geology and the soil uh, deficiency. Uh, so that's why a lot of people take uh, the supplements. But for me, as an isotope geochemist, or a chemist, I would say, because it's not geo so much anymore, it looks like more like that. So I'm more interested to say, okay, zinc has actually five stable isotopes, iron has three, calcium has four. So I would see it like that way. And what, uh, what are isotopes? I think most of you know what isotopes are, but I give a very often talks to people in the, uh, in the medical field and they know radioactive isotopes because they use it as a tracer. Um, so, you know, isotopes have the same numbers of protons in the nuclei and the same numbers of electrons. They differ numbers of neutrons and their uh, chemically behavior is slightly different. So the, uh, the first person who found that was Frederick, Frederick Soddy. Um, he um, got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, I think in 1914. Um, he found that the atoms of one, the same element behave slightly different, but he couldn't explain it. I mean, he explained it, but he didn't have a name for it. So then he met Margaret Todd, which is actually a medical doctor. And she gave him the suggestion because yesterday was Women's Day and he mentioned that she actually came up with the term isotopes. So she said, it was long-term not recognized that she came up with this term. She said to him, why don't you call it isotopos? I mean, isopos is a Greek word for same place. Same place in the periodic table, just slightly different chemical behavior. So yeah, so then he used the terms isotopes and uh, yeah, now we are, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so then uh, JJ Thompson and Francis Aston were the first to develop the mass spectrometer got the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, both of them, for measuring basically the isotopic uh, composition. And coming from Colombia, I need to mention Harold Urey. He was the first, so he's the pioneer in isotope geochemistry. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1934, and um, he discovered heavy water. And his work is very, one of the very fundamental work in isotope geochemistry. It's the thermodynamic properties of isotopic substances. He wrote it when he was already at the University of Chicago in 1946. And he, he nicely describes that's from his uh, paper. He nicely describes how isotopes behave so that we always thought like the, uh, the atoms of an element were identical, but that's not the case because they have slightly different thermodynamic properties. And this really tiny difference makes a difference in how they behave and that leads to the separation of isotopes into different phases, solid phase, liquid phase, uh, a gaseous phase. And he already mentioned the application, being here at the climate uh, center, uh, that this can be used to uh, determine temperatures at geological formations. So what is uh, fractionation? <laughs> so what I said is basically the separation of the isotopes light versus heavy uh, isotopes into different uh, phases, when I say gaseous, fluid, or solid phase. And the reason for that is if you think of the energy you require to break some bonds um, in, in the form, you need more energy to overcome this hill, energy hill for the heavy isotopes versus the light. So if you're not an isotope geochem, it's very easy to understand. It's like lighter isotopes react faster than heavy isotopes. Uh, heavier have stronger bonds because you need, to, need more energy to break the bonds. Um, isotopic fractionation for light elements in the periodic table is larger than for heavy because the mass difference is much bigger. And isotopic fractionation is larger for uh, when you change the oxidation state because you, you change the chemical properties and you need to break the bonds. 
is larger for that. And if you think of any reaction, which is not an oxidation, change in oxidation state, let's say, think of absorption binding on proteins or something like that. Okay, and that metal isotopes are very powerful tool shows the most very recent, I would say recent papers that they're all published in Science and Nature. Uh, they helped us to understand um, much better the origin of the moon or also uh, the, the rise of uh, animals in space on the atmospheric level. So they're all great, great papers. So if you get a chance, read them. Um, but when it works for Earth, and my understanding was if it works for Earth sciences, and it's all about isotope fractionates based on the chemical properties and the physical and chemical properties, we are also made of we are chemistry, we have physics, so human body. So why shouldn't it work for humans, right? So because every object is defined by its elemental and isotopic composition. So we also, that's why I think we are made of isotopes. So when it works for the for the mantle, if it works for the formation of the moon and understanding cycling in the environment, why shouldn't it work for humans? So because we are mainly made out of the isotopes of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and a little bit of sulfur, and even a little less of all the essential metals. Let's say, let's say, look at iron, copper, zinc, calcium, magnesium. We have strontium. All of these elements, they, they are not strontium, but the others are essential metals. They have all stable isotopes we can measure. But also, we can look at how toxic metals change in our body. Let's say we could look at lead, cadmium, selenium is essential and toxic, so it's a tricky antimony, um, chromium. So how they behave, how they change metabolic pathways, because metabolic pathways just chemi chemical reactions. Okay, so when we measure these isotopes, they, basically the idea was can isotope ratios can tell us why and how changes in our body occur. And the first paper they, it was from 2002 from a group in Germany, and uh, they looked at the iron isotopic composition in uh, blood from uh, female, male, and children. Um, and they were surprised to see actually that there is a difference. If you look at the, the slider isotope, that's heavy, and then they compare it to plants and animal products. And what they found is that females have a slightly heavy isotopic composition than male. And that was very interesting. So why could it happen? No, no one understood. It was just a pilot study. So they interpreted it, so it has something to do with the genotypes and it has something to do how women absorb iron. So from there, it all started. That was that, okay, we can use the isotopes. We can see small differences, but why do they occur? Um, and uh, by that time now, basically uh, more studies came out. It's still in the pilot stage, I have to be fair. <laughs> So for the ones in green, these are the very common ones. They are already very well established. Um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. Uh, strontium too for forensic studies, it's commonly used. Um, the ones in red, these are the elements we have already data or there are already studies been done for iron, copper, zinc, lead, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And elements we would be, they could be interesting in future would be nickel as, um, Toxic element and um, cadmium as a toxic element because it interacts with copper and zinc in the body, uh, mercury, uranium, and molybdenum. And what we can try to understand is basically our metabolism, the effect of the diet, the effect of the environment, how we are exposed, or how everything around us affects us, and how our metabolism, like diseases, growth for children, uh, are affected, and how we can use it as a, by a marker for different diseases or uh, even as a tracer for uh, nutrient deficiency, for example. So what I try to do is like using isotope metallomics and establish it in the field of environmental health sciences, uh, which is challenging because if you are, as a geologist coming and try to the funding agency, explain them a tool, which is like, we always say, oh, this is a tool from earth sciences. And they say, wow, okay, how can you apply that in the biomedical field? It's very far-fetched for them. And so, um, but we're getting closer. So because the good thing is with uh, the biological samples, very often what they use, they use organic biomarkers. And organic biomarkers are not always stable for a long time. It also depends heavily how the samples were stored. Not always samples were stored at the right temperature. 
So the, uh, the organic biomarkers break down after a while, but isotopes, they stay stable. So they are there. You can use the samples, even if you archive them for 20 years. In a lot of cohort studies, they have samples from 40 years ago. So we can still use them and analyze them. And they can actually help us. We can use different um, biospecimens and look at the isotopic composition. We can use blood, we can use urine, serum, hair, whatever you can think of and analyze. And they can actually tell us, provide us information about uh, the biological processes. So we can say if there's a change in the redox condition in your body because you are have it's because of oxidative stress because oxidative stress what it does it just oxidizes some bindings of your proteins it will release some of the metals for example or the metal protein binding might change because if you need to develop a disease some of the proteins are overexpressed or underexpressed or some uh, um, pathways change uh, and then the idea is we can use it as biomarkers in uh, large epi studies uh, so we, we have studies there like 7,000 participants. Right now, it's the, the processing time for isotopes is a bit challenging, but um, because it takes a long time to measure the samples, but now we are working on making it shorter time so that we can even measure 7,000 samples, the isotopic composition in these participants. Um, and also the, the toxicological effects. So when we look at, we are studying uranium, for example, what are the pathways of uranium in, in the body, which is not well understood. So just a few examples of papers, they're already out. So these are like a few studies have been done. Um, some of them are gen uh, genetic disease. They found difference in isotopic composition of copper in blood with the Wilson disease um, and uh, ALS. Um, then of course, bone health. Um, we can look at, can look at calcium isotopes and uh, um, how uh, calcium isotopes are incorporated in the bones, but you don't want to measure the bones, so you measure the urine, and you see there's a change in the urine calcium isotopic composition, and you can see early stages of osteoporosis. Um, and of course, for children, uh, bone health is very important. We can use it as a, a marker for aging, uh, because with, with age, uh, your uh, protein composition changes and the binding of proteins, also your kidney function changes, uh, so you can measure that and understand, use the isotopes to uh, look at the, uh, the aging processes. Uh, they have a, there's a nice uh, mouse study out and looking at different isotopes in uh, the mice and with age. Uh, you can use it as a indicator for different type of cancer. We know that pancreatic cancer is uh, one of the deadliest type of cancer because there's no early detection. Uh, so the idea is, can we use uh, isotopes as a more sensitive biomarker to detect uh, pancreatic cancer at its early stages? Um, also the same for breast cancer, because there are different phenotypes of, uh, genotypes of uh, cancer, and can we disentangle them if uh, cancer is going to be uh, metastasis, uh, great metastasis or not? So if you think of, uh, so what we need for that, <laughs> We need a multi-collector ICP mass to very precisely measure the isotopic composition. Uh, unfortunately, that's the only instrument we can use right now to precisely measure the small differences. And if you look at uh, the publications on um, using a multi-collector ICP mass, I just did a search on NCBI, and you see over time the numbers of publications went up. It's but it's mainly because it's in the environmental and geology the field of geology and environmental sciences. So the um, Precision normally depends on, of course, the element. It's a point of five uh, per mil, so we can measure very small differences. This is the instrument, or like a, the, the part of the instrument in at Lamont in at Columbia, and that was the instrument I used at Oxford. Okay, now uh, going to the application of isotopes. So a bit more deeper in which which studies uh, the studies I worked on. Okay. So first of all, we need to understand more the fundamental process of like a lot of people use like, oh, it's isotopes. This is, the, this is the ratio. What does it tell us? But we don't understand really the fundamental process first behind, like how isotopes are they when they bind onto uh, metal binding proteins and mainly on the amino acids. And that could be the application for every field. It's like it's, you can use it for any organics basically. Um, so we don't know, when we look at amino acids, we have um, 
We have sulfur binding site, we have sulfur ligands, uh, which is cysteine, we have oxygen ligands with glutamate, and then we have a nitrogen uh, ligands, which are histidine. Um, so what is what like metals, like divalent metals do, they preferentially bind on, so there is an ab initial calculation. So it's a ter in theory, we have understood how it binds. So heavy isotopes preferentially bind to nitrogen, stronger bonds. Sulfur preferentially binds to lighter isotopes, but it has never been experimentally proven that this is correct. So I worked with a group at Rutgers. Uh, we use, uh, they have the uh, alpha fold, which is a, a protein bank where they put in all the information about proteins. We use that, uh, we started to use that to understand with different proteins and the metal binding, how we can predict later uh, the isotopic fractionation when we know how are their amino acids uh, composition. So what we did, we did a very simple experiment. This is a dialysis chamber. So where you have on one side, you have the metals. On the other side, you have your ligands and then only the metals can diffuse through a membrane um, and they bind on they bind on the ligands. And then you can measure the isotopic fractionation. So we did it for cysteine, glutamate and histidine. And this is the paper where they did the theoretical calculation and that's what we measured and it matches very nicely. So it's Good, but not very often actually the calculations, the theoretical calculation match the experimental work. So it's normally off. So that's great that it's <laughs> that's worked perfectly fine. And the idea is what we now propose is uh, because all our proteins and cells, so even if you work in oceanography and salt science, you have proteins, you have cells, if you work with bacteria. The basic is always the same. It's their amino acids and how they bind these metals. If you can use copper, you can use zinc, you can use nickel would be another one. Um, how they bind and you can translate this to the proteins and then later to the cells. And it has applications for all these fields basically. Um, so that's something we propose uh, for a grant. Okay, and then um, how can we use another? So this is the fundamental study uh, we are still working on and uh, it's ongoing work um, with, uh, with the postdoc. And now I did, uh, when, during my time at Oxford, I worked on uh, using metal isotopes as a cancer marker. Um, as I said, um, we also, I started to, to work with a group uh, in oncology he, uh, with uh, oops, sorry, Adrian Harris. He is an expert in uh, uh, breast cancer research, and uh, and then he uh, Chris Schofield, he's a organic chemist, a professor in organic chemistry. And what we wanted to wanted to understand, like, okay, how we've been we've been know we already know that for breast cancer, um, zinc is accumulated in the in the malignant tissue. So there's more zinc in the malignant tissue, but why? So why does that cells all of a sudden accumulate more zinc. So is it the zinc transporters into the cell are expressed more? Um, so we did an experiment with cell lines and we wanted and to understand if we uh, expose the cells, we did the expose the cells first on the petri dish with zinc and then measured the isotopic composition the difference. And then we flushed it because what, what it does basically in your body, it's like a very quick turnaround time of, uh, of, of uh, um, zinc. And you have this like little vesicles. Uh, they're very tiny. They're called extracellular vesicles. Uh, that's like a hot topic now. So if you read that, everybody works on that now. EVs is a big thing. <laughs> um, so they excrete and they can they carry all the information from the malignant cell to the next cell. And they also carry all the information for the isotopes with that. So what we did with flushing, basically, we, ex we see how much extra uh, cellular vesicles are excreted on their isotopic composition, and this is that reflected uh, in the composition. So, unfortunately, what happened is the, the experimental setup is great, but it never reflects the human body. The cell line is not the same as like we're going from how amino acids bind it. We go to one step further; it's the, the the cell line study, and then we go to the human body. We did a but we did a human body first, and it's like okay, that's cool, that's very interesting. We see it, we see differences in uh, malignant tissue isotopic composition compared to healthy tissue, but we couldn't explain it. Then we went to that setup, and it's completely the opposite, and we still cannot explain it. <laughs> But the, uh, the idea is, is like when you have healthy um, 
when we have healthy humans, we are, should be all more or less the same isotropic composition. Of course, it varies a little bit on your diet, um, but if you're healthy, it should be the same. Um, and then, but if you, if you develop a disease, what I said, because some of the metallic proteins and the cells, they are changing and they overexpress or underexpress some of the pathway. <coughs> and with disease progression, you would see that the isotopic, this is the isotopic composition, hypothetically. So you see that with disease progression, you would change the isotopic composition in one or another direction. And um, we think that the isotopes, because they are so sensitive, it's more likely that we detect the disease earlier than it's currently done in uh, the techniques that are available. And the techniques are different for each uh, type of cancer. Uh, and that is that it is very promising, uh, was shown for liver cancer. We did a copper and sulfur isotopic analysis. And then again, we did the pancreatic cancer uh, analysis. And then it did also some copper isotopes in ovarian cancer. So the idea why I thought uh, urine is the better approach in blood, blood is way too complex. Uh, urine actually can magnify the signal. So in the blood, you have very high zinc concentration. Uh, in the urine, it's uh, or much is lower. Um, and also, so the, because the, the urine reflects basically uh, some of the uh, blood signal, but what I said, uh, magnifies it. So if you if you're healthy, basically you have the kidney, it's glomerular filtration. So your have the blood, it's the, the kidney basically stops to keep all the small proteins in uh, small proteins and large proteins should be not crossing uh, the net of the kidney. Um, and so you have uh, that the healthy should be the same for the kidney before and after, like in the urine and the blood. But when you develop a disease, you, you see probably a shift in the isotopic composition. And that's what we thought. So the problem is very small sample. What they, they are, the isotopic composition is lighter compared to the healthy control group. Um, we hypothesized that this has something to do with metallocyanine, which is a very common uh, binding protein, very tiny one. It's just uh, 20 kilodalton, but that's like storage for zinc and copper in the human body. But uh, metallocyanine is uh, over, wait, let me see, under, no. Because of cancer, you have inflammation, you have oxidative stress, and metallocyanin is a sulfur, has a sulfur ligand, so it releases isotopically light zinc. Because what I said before, sulfur preferentially <laughs> binds isotopically light zinc, nitrogen binding sites bind preferentially isotopically heavy zinc. So then we did a similar study with a uh, group um, um, in out in Oxford, with Al uh, Alastair Lamb. Yeah, he uh, is an expert in uh, prostate cancer and uh, from, from a period college. He was a PhD student at the time. And we looked at, can we um, use it for other type of cancer? When we say, okay, great, it looks different for pancreatic cancer. Can we use it as a biomarker? But it doesn't work if it looks for all cancer the same, then we cannot use it as a biomarker. Um, so we did it for prostate cancer and we see that basically this is not so much different between healthy and prostate cancer. But for prostate cancer, it was more interesting. It doesn't come up there with circles actually here. Um, because for prostate cancer, what we don't know is like there are different risk groups. Uh, prostate cancer can be easily detected, but the risk groups are not, are you in a low, intermediate, or high risk for those men? Um, that's very difficult to identify. So we wanted to see when we look at, let me see, low risk group, basically, it's very unlikely that you develop prostate cancer. These these ones are very close to the line of the healthy, um, average value of the healthy group. Then if you've been immediate group, it's like here, there was a circle basically. Uh, and then if you are the high risk group, you are down here. And that has something to do again with the cysteine binding and complexation of uh, uh, thing. So we can see based on the risk groups, if you use not the whole data set, but split them, that depending on your risk group, uh, you, there is a difference in isotopic composition in the urine. Oops. Um, going back to uh, the breast cancer study, um, what we, uh, what I said, we also measured, what we did, we measured different uh, tissue of uh, patients uh, with um, 
uh, malignant tissue, benign tissue, and then this is neighboring tissue from uh, malignant and benign uh, cancer, um, and then the healthy tissue. We wanted to see, is there any difference in the isotopic composition? And we see there's clearly different for the tissue for malignant and benign compared to the healthy one. But, and then somewhere this uh, uh, malignant uh, neighboring tissue falls in between. So it's a combination of these two, because what I said, the extra, uh, uh, extracellular vesicles, they excrete it, they go to the neighboring cell, and that could be the neighboring tissue, basically. So that's why it's a mix between that and this. Okay, now I'm going to something completely different. <laughs> Metal as an exposure marker. That's something we just started, and if you live in New York, um, you have a lot of sources of lead exposure. You can, um, so when you think of lead exposure in the, in in, uh, in uh, New York, they even they have advertisements saying you should test your children for uh, lead levels. Um, but very often you don't know what's the source of the lead. Um, it could be it could be the pipe, it could be the air. If you're in a city, of course, it could be the water, the paint. A uh, lot of in New York it's also the paint. Of course, secondhand smoke for children. Um, even your pet <laughs> could be because of the dust. And what uh, another study uh, by Sarah Dodd in 2018 found that there, they could uh, see the different sources here, looking at the lead isotopic composition, when they looked at, okay, the rice had a distinct isotopic composition compared to the hair and the house dust. So you could see that hair and house dust uh, are matching uh, compared to the rice. So they, they, they basically say that this is the source. What we do in terms of metal isotope exposure, so I'm part of a super fund program funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in the US. Um, this is a big center, uh, it's a big program normally funded by up to 20 years. We had a center before, which was in Bangladesh, working on arsenic contamination. Uh, now we move to um, uh, tribal communities in, in the US and Native American land uh, um, uh, reservations. And a lot of reservations there, they have private wells because if people live very far apart, they cannot afford, um, they're getting their water tested, they're not connected to a community water system, um, and they have very high levels of uranium and arsenic uh, in their water. <laughs> high level, not as high as I learned <laughs> they're here around Bangalore, but they have uh, like levels which are concerning, which can cause chronic diseases. Um, so what we wanted, or what we do as a team, so she's the director, Anna Navas and she's the director of our super fund uh, uh, program. And in our project, it's uh, Sir Alex Saliday and Anirban uh, Vasu, we are looking at developing uh, isoscape maps for this area on the reservation to understand, for looking at uranium isotopes, to understand if we have a distal or a local source. Looking at the activity, uranium activity ratio and also looking at uh, uranium 238 and 234 to understand if there is reduction happening or if not. So what's the environmental processes? Um, this, um, then we also look at urine. So we have, when we think of a map, an isoscape map, just a hypothetical isoscape map for uh, uranium and you ingest uranium, something happened in your body, metabolic processes, and what is the signal in, uh, in, in the urine? we can understand what's happening in your body, basically. Uh, is, is uranium the only source? Is the water the only source? Are other sources like food? Because we cannot measure everything what people eat and are exposed to. So we only look at the water composition and then at the urine. Um, we do the same for selenium. I, I worked on selenium, so that's why I was interested in selenium, because what I said, selenium is an, is an essential metal, but also toxic. And selenium, we have selenocysteine. And if you are, for example, because of uranium exposed to high uranium level, it causes oxidative stress, it will oxidize your selenium cysteine, and then you will excrete more selenium. And that will change the isotopic composition as well. So the idea is like, if you think of drinking water in, for selenium and you're exposed to heavy metals, you also have arsenic there and you have probably lead there as well. So um, then you have selenium in the water. So then inflammation causes oxidative stress, as I just said. And if you are in homeostasis, so that means if everything is fine, you don't uh, have oxidative or too much oxidative stress, uh, then selenium, uh, selenium protein synthesis should be in balance. And um, you should excrete heavy selenium isotopes because it's a selenium sulfur 
binding. So, so what would be the light isotope state in the body? Um, uh, but if, if it's not in balance, you have basically oxidation or methylation. That's another pathway in the human body to detoxify. Um, and then you would excrete isotopic lighting. And that's basically what we expect to see that uh, if you have no exposure, you have a bit more heavy isotopes. And if you are exposed, then you have light isotopes in the urine. OK, so the, since that's a very, very new field, um, um, and the good thing is NIHS in the US is very interested in that, and a lot of institutions are now interested uh, and want to uh, look at the isotopic composition. We have also a, a study um, looking at uh, giving EDTA as a chelator if people are exposed to high levels of lead, or there's a chelator study they're looking at how it improves uh, um, cardiovascular disease if you take EDTA, uh, because it washes out a lot of lead. Uh, interestingly, they have shown it for uh, concentration measurements, but they are not, they have not um, looked at, they don't know where it's coming from in the human body. So we, we are going to look at uh, the isotopic composition as a clinical trial right now. So what the idea is, we'd like to uh, measure, expand it to other isotope systems as well, like have larger studies, larger cohorts, because it's very limited right now. And yeah, it establishes as a disease marker. Um, so we're working also with the Cancer Center at Columbia um, to use it for other types of cancer. And find, uh, the difficult part is finding the right biospecimen. Not every biospecimen is good for the isotopes as it is for the concentration of metals. Um, and of course, the idea is we need to work more closer in isotope metallomics with uh, people in in, in the environmental science field and the biomedical field, I think we need to be more interdisciplinary. And that is actually an interdisciplinary field. Um, and yeah, so that's all the people I've worked with, I think, in the last five years. Not everyone is there, but most of them are there. Um, who either provided the samples by PhD students, uh, postdocs, uh, uh, an, an NGO. Um, and that's uh, my metal lab team, uh, where we do all the cohort studies. These are all the students. Uh, these are all PhD students in epidemiology, most of them. Uh, and that's yeah, I work with the Earth and Super Fund uh, program. I'm also part of the Environmental Health Center in Northern. Manhattan, uh, which is also funded by the NIHS. Um, I would like to thank you. <laughs>